Super quiet. It's pretty cool. Um, as I begin today, uh, we I have to take you back uh, to the start of 2024. We shared how we really felt as as a staff that we wanted 2024 to be a year of testimony. And so I want to begin with a testimony of healing that I experienced today. Um, so earlier today, I'm doing some sermon prep. Not for today's sermon. This was already done, but I'm, I'm over the horizon working on the next series, No Longer Slaves uh, to Fear, starting April 7th, and I'm working on that message. And I'm at my computer in the basement in my home office, and my eyes went blurry. started to go blurry, and I started to see, like, kind of, I don't know how to describe it. But I couldn't focus. Um, it was something that uh, I've had before. haven't had, had one for years. They're called ocular migraines. And so it starts with being unable to focus where it's almost like one eye is seen nearsighted and one eye is seen farsighted. So you can see, but you can't focus on anything. And you kind of get a tunnel vision thing going on. And it makes you walk sideways, very disorienting. Um, and again, the first ocular migraine we had in several years, so I called Kelly, she was out, and uh, asked her to start praying. She sent a text message to a group of prayer warriors. By the way, how many, how many of you got that text message and were praying for me? Hands up, I know there's a dozen of you. And so people are praying. We always say, uh, when in doubt or if you need healing, fire in every direction. So do everything you can in the natural, do everything you can in the supernatural. And so I knew from past, like I need to drink a ton of water, I took a couple Advil. I tried not to ever take Advil, but I took a couple Advil. And then I laid down. I have some healing scriptures on my phone, put that in my earbud, and I just laid down, closed my eyes, and just like have it wash over me. Um, when I've had these things in the past, sometimes they've, they last, they've lasted for several hours. And um, if that one did, again, this was all noon, I'm thinking, I won't be able to see my sermon notes if, I, if it's still happening or if... If the migraine kicks in, I'm going to be having to sit in a chair. Um, but thankfully, truly, after maybe an hour or two, I felt 80% better. So much so that Kelly and I this afternoon were able to walk our golden retriever, Lily, for our two-mile walk. And so, honestly, thank you so much, everybody, for praying. We share testimonies to give glory to God. And because testimony in its root means to do again, and so at the end of the service today, we're going to offer opportunities. Again, if you need prayer for anything at all, we're going to have a prayer team that's going to be up front here. But particularly, if, if anybody has any eye issues, migraines, headaches, we definitely want to pray for you. Because what God did to me, he's no respecter of persons. He can do again. He can do again. And one other thing, right before... I got here uh, today, I started reading a book by Dr. Mike Hutchings. I shared, I'm, I'm going to seminary, working at my doctor, and I was out in Pennsylvania, and he shared about uh, healing from PTSD, and that's something you aren't supposed to be healed from, but that's in the natural, but in the supernatural, God can heal all. And so um, I just was reading a book about healing of trauma, all forms of trauma. And so even as I just said that word, Trauma, it doesn't mean you have to be in the battlefield. We all battle trauma. If there's something where you are traumatized or you just feel, I would love some prayer to break free from trauma, please come forward for that as well because I don't believe it's any coincidence. I just got this, that in the mail a uh, couple hours ago and started reading it and felt that nudge. So um, may it be. And actually, even better, may you be healed by those things as I preach. May you be healed as, by those things as we take communion, as we worship, so that when you come forward, it's a testimony and not a prayer. But either way, we'd love to pray for you or celebrate with you if God heals you between now and then. Amen? Amen. Come on. Come on. So at our church, we love to say we hope you don't just go to church, but you encounter God. And, and when it comes to Good Friday, we want to fine-tune that a bit because I don't want you just to encounter God today in general. I really pray that you have an encounter with the crucified Christ. That you have an encounter with the crucified Christ. And that as we do that, as we encounter the crucified Christ, I pray that we more clearly understand our identity in Christ. Because there's a part of our identity 
that we often don't think about when it comes to Good Friday. If, if you're part of our church, we just ended a series called There's Got to Be More to Christianity Than This. And that series was about our identity and also God's identity, who God is, and then who God says we are. And this sermon is about a key aspect of that identity. It's a key thing that keeps us in chair number one, which I preached about a lot in that series, and about something also that takes us out of chair number two and gets us back into chair number one. And if you have no idea what I just talked about because you've never been to our church before, chair one, chair two, what are you talking about? It's okay. It'll still make sense. The sermon will still make sense. But if you've been part of our series, this is really a continuation about just wanting to focus and live life to the full, which is what chair number one is all about. So tonight's sermon is called Gratitude. And I really ask, I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would really give everyone fresh ears to hear what I'm about to preach today, that if you go to church every Good Friday, um, it's very easy to have that been there, done that attitude and to really miss what I'm about to preach about the death of Jesus. Maybe for some of you here, this is all new to you. But I pray for all of us that we would have fresh ears to hear. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you do that? And I know he will. So 2,000 years ago, on, on the day today that we now call Good Friday, Jesus died on the cross. Right now it's 7.32 p.m. So we know that 2,000 years ago, on that first Good Friday, Jesus would have already breathed his last breath. His body would have been prepared for burial, and he'd soon be placed in a tomb, and that would happen before dusk. At dusk on that first Good Friday, the Sabbath day would have begun, which is a day of rest in the Jewish culture. And everyone, when the Sabbath began, would have paused and reflected, and I'm sure mourned and cried a ton, remembering Reflecting on the whirlwind of events that just happened. As dusk began, I'm sure they were thinking about that previous 24 hours of the life of Jesus. So let me explain. Let me rewind 24 hours. 24 hours before Jesus was breathing his last breath. He was eating his last meal. The last supper is what we call it now on our planet with his closest followers. Right after dinner, right after that supper, the last supper, he was betrayed by one of the 12, by Judas. He's arrested. He spends a sleepless night being dragged from one place to the next, put on a series of mock trials where he ends up being sentenced to death. And if the agony of being crucified was not enough, By the time he was nailed to the cross, he had already suffered in ways that we cannot even imagine. I want to share just a few examples of what Jesus experienced the hours before he was nailed to the cross. Luke chapter 22 is where we'll begin. He'd already been arrested at this point in the narrative. And here's what happens. Just picture this, enter into the story. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. Jesus is mocked, he is beaten, he is blindfolded, he is insulted. Several hours later, again, after a sleepless night, he's standing before a crowd that's crying out for his death as Pontius Pilate declares and decides his fate. Mark chapter 15. What shall I do then with this one you call king of the Jews, Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And finally, after all that, and I preached whole sermons on one, and he was flogged. There's like a whole sermon in there. It was ta- finally time for him to die in the most excruciating way ever invented by man. Going back to the Gospel of Luke, 
chapter 23, it says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus began to hang on that torture device known as a Roman cross for hours and hours, skipping down to verse 44. It says, it was about noon. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple, which is as thick as a human hand, was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. So that's a summary again of the final 24 hours of Jesus' life. And now I want to rewind to how those 24 hours began. This is where we're going to focus tonight. 24 hours before Jesus was breathing his last breath, he was eating his last meal on our planet. Here's what it says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus takes the bread, he takes the cup, he gives both to his closest followers. But before he passed the bread and the cup to them, he does something that's very easy to read right past, but something that is significant. Here's a portion of both of those verses, which highlights what I'm talking about. Verse 26 and 27 of Matthew 26 says, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, it says, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks. I want you to imagine this. Again, if you know the rest of the story, we can read right past it, but imagine how profound this is. The meal It's about to end. Jesus is not surprised by anything that is happening or anything that's about to happen. He knows that after this meal is going to end, he is going to be betrayed by one of the 12 apostles, one of his closest friends, Judas. He's going to be arrested by Roman soldiers, put on a series of mock trials where he would be beaten He would be insulted. He would be flogged. He would be crucified, slowly dying. And all that was going to take place over the next 24 hours with a sleepless night. And yet, knowing all of those things were about to happen, the text says two different times, Jesus paused. And he gave thanks. Now, when you go beyond the English to the original Greek that the New Testament was originally written in, there's something fascinating in the text. I read from a whole different, like a whole bunch of Bible translations. I've read from the NIV translation primarily tonight which is an English translation. And the word thanks appears two times in English. One of the Greek words used in this passage for the word thanks is the Greek word eucharisteo. Eucharisteo means, it actually means thanksgiving or giving thanks or being thankful. Now, if you have Catholic roots to your faith like I do, I was born and raised over in Clinton Township going to St. Ronald's. Um, As a Catholic there's like a bell going off in in your brain because the word communion, we called it Holy Eucharist. It comes right from the Greek word, Eucharistao. So again, Eucharistao means means giving thanks, means thanksgiving. It means being thankful. And, And because of that fact, because when it says Jesus gave thanks... He used the word Eucharisteo. Back in ancient times, church tradition, this meal was named a handful of things, but one of them was the thank you meal. 
In the decades following the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Last Supper was called the thank you meal. And the name of this meal came from what Jesus did during the meal. He gave thanks twice. And that hints at a key aspect of our identity, of what God wants for us, what God wants for you and for me. And so as I thought about tonight, as I prayed about the sermon, especially with the last sermon series, in our minds, in my mind, As I said up front, I hope that you don't just encounter God in general tonight, but, but that you encounter the crucified Christ. So, but the question is how? How, how should we do that? How would I want everyone, if, if, if God would, would answer a prayer, what, what prayer would I pray? And this was it. As I thought about what emotions I want myself to feel, I want all of you to feel. When you think of the cross, when you think of what Jesus did, well, See, here's what happens. When it comes to Good Friday every year, uh, if you normally come to church on Good Friday, a very common emotion to feel is conviction, conviction over our sin, right? All of the thoughts we think that don't honor God, all of the things we do that don't honor God, all of the, all the words we say that we know don't honor God. And so during communion, you know, we hold the elements for an extended amount of time, than we normally do on a Sunday, and we reflect, and you feel bad for a while. And it's true, you actually do. I say it kind of smiling, because if you're really honest, not all that much changes. You come back next year, it's Good Friday, and you feel bad again. but nothing changes. So instead of going down that familiar path, I want to take a different path. And here's a quote that explains that path from Timothy Gallagher. I love this. The word gratitude lies at the very heart of our entire relationship with God. That's a great quote. The word gratitude lies at the very heart of our entire relationship with God. So when we think about what Jesus did and and how because of the cross, he died for our sins, he defeated the devil, and through his death, he conquered death. When we think of all that was accomplished on the cross, we should be filled to overflowing with gratitude. And just like the text says, Jesus gave thanks at the meal as he looked forward to his death. That as his followers, we should give thanks as we look back at his death. As Christians, a key aspect of our identity should be that we are people, we are people who should be, ought to be more grateful than anyone else on the planet. Amen. Because of what Jesus did, we should be a people that are more grateful than anyone else on this planet. I love this quote from Billy Graham, especially because it comes from Billy Graham. He sounds incredibly charismatic in this. Here we go. When Jesus hung on the cross, a great unseen cosmic battle raged in the heavens. And in the end, Christ triumphed over all the forces of evil and death and hell. Come on. Again, I love that quote because it comes from Billy Graham. And it talks about how when Jesus died, he defeated sin, he defeated the devil, and we know in just a few days he would also defeat death. And so when we think of all that was accomplished on the cross, It's like the epicenter of our faith. It should fill us to overflowing with gratitude. And and my hope is that that would become a thing. It would become a catalyst. Where where then that would compel us, gratitude would compel us to honor God with our thoughts. Gratitude would compel us to honor God with our words. Gratitude would compel us to honor God with our actions. Instead of choosing the familiar path of sin. 
And, and so my prayer, my hope, God's highest prayer, is that when we're back here next Good Friday, and if you took a spiritual snapshot of where you're at right now in your spiritual journey, with the thoughts, words, and actions, and you fast forward one year from now, that you'll have experienced incredible spiritual growth. Not by your strength, not by your power, but by the Spirit, by the power of the Holy Spirit, co-laboring with Christ. And that we won't be struggling with the same junk we're struggling with today. Not again by trying hard, but gratitude compelling us. Growth, spiritual growth fueled by gratitude. And so I pray God does that. That's something God in the supernatural, right, the curtain, as thick as human and torn into, supernatural. Earthquake, supernatural. There's something else I pray God does. And so I want to read some scriptures to you related to Good Friday. And as I do, I pray that God does something that only God can do and that gratitude would supernaturally well up inside of you. That gratitude would just bubble up. And so I pray you don't just hear these scriptures, but that you experience them and that you encounter the crucified Christ as I, as I read them. So I'm going to read a bunch of scriptures back to back. You might want to close your eyes or maybe keep them open. They'll be on the screen if you want to follow along as I read them. You might want to read them silently. But again, I pray right now that just God does something only God can do. And the gratitude would well up as I read these. Let me begin in John chapter 14, the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Romans because of what Jesus did on the cross. It says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. I love that. He didn't wait till we got our act together. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I love this. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Colossians, Colossians 2. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Come on. The power of sin, right? We were born slaves to sin. And Jesus broke the power of sin. More words of Jesus. I'm going to read both from the NIV and the Amplified translation. John 14. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then John 16, Amplified Translation. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, then the helper, the comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says that he won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to be in close fellowship with you. The Apostle Paul with this to Galatians, I love this. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that because, right, we read John 3.16, for God's soul of the world, that's true. But I love this because Paul personalizes it. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For me, for you, yes, for the world, but for each of us individually. The Apostle John writes this, John 1, 12, but as to many who did receive and welcome Jesus, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. And I love this. The author of Hebrews declared this in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross for the joy set before him.
Because of what Jesus did on the cross, those are, again, just a small handful of things that are true. And as I read those passages, I pray that gratitude is welling up inside of you supernaturally. That you don't just hear those scriptures, but that you experience those scriptures and that you are encountering the crucified Christ through them. Because God's word is living and active. So in your bulletin, there was a sheet, the blank side, I probably, I probably should, should have said this up front, to take notes as I preach. <laughs> so hopefully it's not still blank. But even if it is, grace and violence, we'll have to say that. On the back are questions to dig deeper. And these are questions, I would encourage you, sometime maybe tonight into tomorrow, maybe even into Easter Sunday morning before you come to church, to go through these questions to help make the sermon stick to process, either with with those in your household, you can do them by yourself, maybe with some friends. But to go through all these questions, I'm going to focus right now on question number six. And it says this. This is part of question six in your bulletin. Between now and Easter Sunday, what are some things you can do to help you not take Jesus' death on the cross for granted and instead be filled for gratitude with what he did for you? It's a really good question. When we think about what Jesus did, how he died for us, it's so easy to take his actions for granted, especially if you're a church-going person. I pray we don't do that this year, but instead of taking those actions for granted, that, that they would fill us with gratitude. And so with that question as like an overarching action step in mind, I want to give you four specific ways to do that. Again, I pray God does something profound. The first one is this, is to read the crucifixion accounts with a heart filled with gratitude. Also, in your bulletin, we have a half sheet, which is a harmony of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, broken up into six acts. And that what I did was I took the accounts of the final 24 hours of Jesus' life, and I harmonize them, put the, or, the events in order as they occurred in history. And that this would be a great way to read Scripture, again, tonight into tomorrow. And perhaps, again, an encouragement, right? I preached, I think it was the last sermon I preached about the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18.21, has life and death in it. And so perhaps as you read these out loud, to say out loud, Thank you, Jesus. As you read, thank you, Jesus. To declare that, thank you, Jesus. That's your first action step. Again, a great tool we love to say at the church. We say encounter, equip, and engage. The equip is equipping you, and this is a tool to equip you in your faith. Second action step is to examine your conscience with gratitude. So as we hold the communion elements, as we come forward and, and we hold the elements and, and we think back, we reflect in our thoughts and words and actions that fall short of the glory of God, the, all the sins that nail Jesus to the cross. And again, we are going to do that tonight during our service, but I encourage you to do that later on tonight, into tomorrow, to reflect, but not just examine your conscience to feel bad. <laughs> Not to pile on the guilt, but instead to examine your conscience in the spirit of gratitude. Saying again and again, Romans 5, 8, well, I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. Thank you, Jesus. And again, as you reflect, as you examine your conscience, just say that. Third action step. By the way, I'm going to give you four. Don't feel like you have to do all four <laughs> as the Holy Spirit leads you. Reread the scriptures from today's sermon and do so with gratitude. If we could keep this slide on the screen for a bit so that you could not have that blank part be blank. It'd be great things to write down. These are not in your digging deeper questions. But to reread the scriptures that I read to you, 
but to read them with gratitude. And again, maybe after you read each passage, like read it slowly and reflect. And again, with the words, thank you, Jesus, on your lips. Again, John 14, Romans 5, Colossians 2, John 14, John 16, Galatians 2, John 1, and Hebrews 12. As you're, for those of you who are capturing those, I want to start by talking about the fourth action step. This is something we're actually doing as a family, Kelly, the girls, and I, um, after church tonight. It's to watch a movie about the life of Christ this weekend with gratitude. To watch a movie. Take some time. To pick a movie, there's a lot of great ones out there. Maybe the Son of God movie, the Jesus production of Sight and Sound Theaters. We're old school, and we have that DVD, and we're going to watch that one tonight. Maybe The Passion of the Christ, which is a tough movie to watch. We were talking earlier with the girls, and they had never watched the whole, the whole thing. We haven't shown that to them yet, but they asked about do you think they exaggerated, if you ever saw the Passion of the Christ, like the flogging scene and the crucifixion scene? I actually think it was underdone as gruesome and excruciating. I remember the first time I saw that. I was on staff at uh, Kensington at the time. We rented the AMC Forum 30 Theater. And I remember watching the Passion, and I intentionally, like, I'm like, during the flogging, during the crucifixion, I'm like, I'm not going to close my eyes. I'm not, I, I sat there, put my hands like this, and just watched tears. Like, whew. That's rated R for a reason. <laughs> What's rated R for a good reason? Maybe an episode of from The Chosen. Big fan of The Chosen. As you watch any of those movies, again, as you're watching them, as you're watching the life of Christ, again, the power of the tongue, life and death, speak words of life. Thank you, Jesus. Again, those are four action steps. Choose your own adventure. Maybe the Holy Spirit will lead you to another one. But four things, again, you could do, and I pray that you do them, again, in a spirit of gratitude. You do them in a spirit of gratitude. I think the Holy Spirit leads you in the ones he wants you to do. As Christians, a key aspect of our identity should be that we are the people on this planet that are the most grateful. Should be. Because 2,000 years ago, the meal was going to end. And after it ended, Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed by one of his closest friends, arrested by Roman soldiers, put on a series of mock trials through a sleepless night, insulted, beaten, crown of thorns jammed on his head, flogged, crucified, suffocating to death. And all that was going to take place over the next 24 hours. And yet Jesus paused two times during that meal. And he gave thanks. And as his followers, we are called to follow in the footsteps of our rabbi, of Rabbi Jesus. And to give thanks. Because the word gratitude lies at the very heart of our relationship with God. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you. Even saying thank you seems like words that 
don't capture what we should feel. But it's what we have. God, I pray as we transition to communion that we would be fully present, that this would be an extended holy moment, an extended chair one moment, an extended time where we focus on you, Jesus, on the cross. And that we are filled to overflowing with gratitude. I pray that we would encounter the crucified Christ and that, God, you would do what only you can do in the supernatural. And that, God, you would transform us from the inside out. That we would not have to manufacture gratitude or try hard to be grateful, but it would bubble up out of us. Jesus, when, when you gave thanks, you didn't have to try. It's who you were, who you are. And may we become more like you. We say yes, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.